Hi, welcome to Med Manus. In this video, we are going to discuss about the pathophysiology of edema. In the last session, we discussed about Starling force, right? That's a very good basic for this session. Link in description box below. So we see peripheral edema in our patients, pulmonary edema in our patients. What is edema first of all? And what causes it? So this is the interstitial space that is in between the cells. Let us see about the interstitium first. So connective tissues are present in the interstitium. So connective tissues, we have cells, we have fibers and a gel matrix. So the cells like fibroblast, macrophages are present and fibers like collagen fibers or elastic fibers may be present or the gel matrix we call it as glycosaminoglycans which is nothing but a combination of sugar and amino acid there are so many examples for glycosaminoglycans or you can say proteoglycans like hyaluronic acid or chondroitin sulfate or heparin sulfate etc so imagine the gel to be like this just for visualization imagine to be the gel like this in between the cells more pathology coming up in this point the first cause for the edema we have discussed is any alteration in the starling force. So we saw about starling force in the previous session. So the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, if it gets increased or the oncotic pressure in the capillary, that is the pressure created by the proteins in the blood vessels, if it gets decreased, the fluid comes out of a blood vessels into the interstitium and gets collected. Or if you have more proteins in the interstitium than normal that is increased oncotic pressure interstitium it pulls the fluid from the blood vessels into the interstitium resulting in edema so these are the alteration in the starling forces let us take some common examples to illustrate this okay first pulmonary edema this is very common case so here I have drawn a right and left heart with the blood vessel supplying the lungs. So this is the alveoli. So the alveoli is normally kept dry with the tight junctions present so that fluid cannot enter into the alveoli. And also the lymphatic capillaries which takes up these proteins and send back to the circulation so that the alveoli is kept completely dry. Suppose if you have increased hydrostatic pressure or decreased oncotic pressure in the capillaries, the fluid oozes out from the capillaries and enters the alveoli resulting in pulmonary edema. Why should the hydrostatic pressure must increase here? So consider the capillary like this. So if you have any obstruction in the flow of blood, a back pressure is created and this increases the hydrostatic pressure, right? So imagine you have mitral stenosis in the left heart or any obstruction in the flow of blood. So a back pressure is created and there is increased hydrostatic pressure which puts the fluid into the alveoli. Or you can take the cirrhosis or say nephrotic syndrome. You have decreased albumin in the blood that decreases oncotic pressure and again fluid enters into the alveoli. Now I want to make one point very clear. So this pulmonary edema can be of two causes, cardiogenic pulmonary edema which is due to the heart and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. What is that non-cardiogenic which is not due to the heart? What if you have damage in the capillary here and damage in the alveoli here? So the fluid enters from the capillary into the alveoli resulting in edema. For example, take ARDS or a burns patient or sepsis patient you can see this non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. I hope this is very clear in your mind now. Now, coming on to the ascites. This is another very common case. So, a fluid collected in the abdomen, for example, take a cirrhosis of a liver. You can see ascites in these patients. Why ascites? The same reason. You have obstruction here. So, there is increased hydrostatic pressure that puts a fluid into the interstitium. Also, the liver produces the albumin. So in this case, you have decreased albumin, that is decreased oncotic pressure in the blood. Again, fluid collected in the interstitium. To explain this more clearly, I have taken the systemic circulation in my sketch here. So this is the left heart and the blood is supplied to the, all the tissues. 
and venous drainage from the all tissues goes into the right heart. From the GI tract, venous drains to the liver and then to the right heart. Now, this is the cirrhosis of liver, which is obstruction in the pathway of venous drainage. So, this creates a back pressure resulting in increased hydrostatic pressure and this causes ascites. Now another common example. What if the patient has some obstruction in the renal artery here? There is low renal perfusion that activates renin angiotensin aldosterone system and there is renal retention of sodium and water. So sodium and water are reabsorbed a lot so that increased hydrostatic pressure that puts a fluid into the interstitium resulting in edema. So these are all some of the examples for the alteration in the Starling forces. Now we'll move on to the second point. Lymphatic obstruction. What is the role of lymph here? One of the main role of a lymph is to take up the proteins and the fluid from the interstitium and send back to the circulation. Why? Because we have filtration going on all the time in our system. So it puts little protein and the fluid into the space. This should be taken away by the lymphatics, otherwise the increased oncotic pressure in the interstitium pulls the fluid out of a capillary, thereby disturbing our circulation. What if the patient present with an obstruction in the lymphatic capillaries? For example, a tumor or infections like filariasis. This obstructs the lymphatic capillaries. The proteins and fluid cannot be taken by them. So the fluid gets collected in the interstitium resulting edema. What if you do a mastectomy or some radiation and remove the lymph nodes? The same result again. Now the third point, inflammation. So there's vasodilation and fluid moves out of capillaries and inflammatory cells and proteins oozes out and fight the infection. Now the final cause that is increased extracellular matrix. Let me explain you clearly. In diseases like Graves disease, you have excess inflammation going on in the body. So the T cell secretes lot of cytokines. This cytokine stimulates the fibroblast and the, this fibroblast starts secreting more and more gel matrix, say for example hyaluronic acid. This hyaluronic acid gets built up in the interstitium resulting in edema. So I'm taking two of the most important clinical finding in Graves disease. What is the clinical feature you see here? Pre-tibial myxedema. So you get edema due to the buildup of hyaluronic acid in the interstitium. This is exophthalmos. This is also due to the buildup of hyaluronic acid in interstitium behind the orbit so that it pushes the eyeball to the front causing exophthalmos. I hope you are very clear in the pathophysiology of edema now. Okay, let us summarize. So edema is a collection of excess fluid in the interstitium. When you have alteration in the Starling force, that is increased hydrostatic pressure or decreased oncotic pressure in the capillary or increased oncotic pressure in the interstitium. Or if there is any obstruction or removal of a lymphatic duct or you have vasodilation in inflammation so that fluid moves out of a capillaries into the interstitium or in diseases like Graves disease, the fibroblast is stimulated by the excess cytokines and is released from the T cells. So the fibroblast secretes lot of proteoglycans that is hyaluronic acid built up in the interstitium. All these cases it results in edema. I hope you are very clear with this concept. If you have any doubts or topic suggestion, please post in the comment section below. See you in next session. Thank you.